May I just welcome you to a, a very beautiful session of teaching uh, related to grief. And we would like for you to uh, just be as quiet as you can uh, and, and let me uh, deal with a problem that is an overwhelming a problem in today's society and bless you to the very best of our abilities as a teacher. And we want to help you. Our experience in a hundred nations of the world uh, qualifies us for dealing uh, with the, the human phenomena. I have seen grief in its, in its very deepest, uh, uh, overwhelming, and I have observed grief uh, in, the, in the highest of places on the face of this earth, and I am acquainted with grief. The prophet uh, Isaiah, speaking of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, said that, that he would be a person uh, acquainted with grief. <laughs> uh, he wouldn't come down here and, and, and sit upon a throne and, and isolate himself from the common people and not understand the sorrows of their hearts, that he would be a person acquainted with their deepest sorrows. In order for us to bless you, I must personally know grief. And I, I, have, known, I have known grief. Uh, when a very small child, I knew what it was for my younger brother to die. Our, they, he was named Archie. And, and, he, and he lived with us for, uh, for 18 months, dearly, dearly, dearly loved by our total family, the last child ever born in our family. And we dearly loved him. And, and even though I was young, I, I knew what it meant to, uh, uh, to lose a member of my family. And from that time, other members of my family, my father and, and my mother and my sister and my brother. Uh, and so I am acquainted uh, with grief. And not only that, uh, we have been very closely related to people in financial disaster till all their life's longings were right down in the dust, finished and terminated. And, and we understood that sort of grief. And we have been by the bedside of those with a lingering illness like cancer and have known the, the, the grief of illness as, as it's been there. And so it isn't that we're talking uh, about a subject that we don't understand it's also a, a subject that's been close to my natural being. You know, God creates us for, for different situations. And God created me uh, that I might care, that I might have compassion. And my life uh, automatically, when I go to a foreign country, immediately I'm drawn to the poverty of those people. And, and I, I'm drawn to the sadness of those people. I'm drawn to the, to, to the problems of those people. You don't have to show them to me. I find them because my spirit reaches out to them, and my spirit reaches out to you. There, there are many, many millions of people in our own land that are suffering the very depths of grief. And I hope you, this is part two of, of the series, and I hope you heard part one. And if you didn't, I hope that you would sit and get that tape so that you could play them uh, together and understand with us. Now, there are voices of gloom and voices of doom in our world today that cause grief. On your international stage of politics, <laughs> it's enough to make you grieve to listen to all the rhetoric that's, that's on your television screen and, and over your radio and in your, and in your magazines and in your newspapers. Uh, the mass media are, are carriers of grief. Uh, I was in President Ford's office one day, and, and he talked to a few of us men of the television media, and he said, gentlemen, uh, 500 good things can happen in this capital city and you won't get a line of it in your newspapers or on your television, but let one bad thing happen and says they'll blow it to the sky. Well, that's the way our world operates and functions, it seems to me, our, our, our sinful world, our world without God. That they're grief makers and, and they're, they're right in the business of making sadness and, and making grief. And God is in the opposite business of making joy and gladness. I would say that in these lessons, there are two things I wish to bring, and that is the sinner will always grieve. The Bible specifically tells us in 2 Corinthians 7 and 10 that there are two kinds of grief. There's the grief, the Bible says, that brings you to repentance and to salvation. That's, that's the good grief. You say, I'm sorry of my sins. I'm really sorry. I'm going to give them up. I'm going to go. And that's good grief. He says there's the, the grief that leads to death. And that's the grief that's, that will not confess the sins, that will not come clean with honesty and integrity and truth. 
And that grief leads to death. And so those are the two types of grief. But what hurts you is this, that there are Christians, uh, a lot of them, who are carrying a burden of grief, and that burden of grief has already been carried by the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Now, he has already carried our sorrows, I, I carried our problems. He's carried those. And if you carry in grief the same that he's already carried, uh, then you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. Heard of a Methodist bishop. That, where there were so many things wrong in his district that he stayed up one night in front of the fire and he kept putting a piece of wood on the fire and wringing his hands and said, my, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? That church is bad and this preacher wants to move and, and I've got so many problems. And, he, and finally the clock struck 12 and he heard a voice. And it was the Lord saying, Bishop, go on to bed and sleep now. I'll stay up the rest of the night and worry. And he caught on pretty quick. He says, I'm sorry, Lord. I should bring my griefs to you and lay them down and leave them there. Every Christian is to bring your sorrows, your hurts, your sadness, and your griefs, and lay them at the foot of the Lord and say, Lord, you're the burden bearer. You promised to bear these things. I bring them to you. I lay them down here, and I don't only lay them down. I leave them down. Some of us bring our problems to Jesus, all right, and we pick them up and take them home with us, too. We're afraid he might keep them. And so we, 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 we nourish them and take them home with us. Some of us love grief so much, that's all we talk about. Everybody we meet, we share with them our grief. And sharing it, we, we, we keep it cooking until it gets bigger and bigger. We want them to know about it. That's an unhappy person. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be joyful. God wants you to have fulfillment. And you'll never find fulfillment in grief. Nobody ever has. The pages of history are written with grief. Unhappy people. It does not have to be that way. As I told you in part one of these series, that grief began because of transgression. Transgression is when you actually do wrong. And grief is born around this thing called transgression. Adam never knew grief until he transgressed against God. And it moved right straight through his family. His son murdered his other, his son murdered, murdered his other son. Cain killed Abel. And, and then, it, then, 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 then you had community grief. Not only was Cain grieved and sad, uh, Abel was dead. The mother had a particular maternal grief. And the father had a particular paternal grief. And, and so you, you had a beginning of an assortment of types of grief. A man grieves a difference from a woman. A woman grieves different from any other person on the face of the earth. A child grieves different from anyone else. Uh, what, what you wouldn't grieve about at all, a child can grieve heavily about it. If he loses his sense of security, then he doesn't feel like he's got a secure home, that the mother's running off one place, a father or another, and they don't feel, they grieve over insecurity that you don't have, you see. And so each step in our lives, we can have grief. We, uh, from a little child, a little child can have pains and have grief. And, and as you grow up, right to the moment you die, the devil's always got a grief that just fits your size. And you've got to learn what to do with it. That's what I want to teach America today. What do we do with our griefs? We have a, a saying in our country that's bad. It's good grief. Well, honey, there is no good grief. I, 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 I ought to tell you that that word there, uh, according to uh, uh, history, is an abbreviation of good God. They didn't have the, they didn't have the uh, audacity to say good God, so they said good grief. It's almost a curse word. And, and that it certainly is, good, is not good English. Uh, there is no such thing as good grief. Grief is no good. Grief has never been any good. Uh, grief is the result of a negative force in the universe and not a positive force. It has to do with the torment of your emotional personality. It has to do uh, with your solical parts. A man is a triune being made up of a spirit and a soul and a body. And all parts of you can grieve. Your body can grieve in pain. Your solical parts, which is your mind, your emotions, and your will, all three of those compartments can grieve. You can grieve in your mind. You can grieve in your emotions. You can grieve in your will power. You can also grieve in your spirit. 
You can grieve in your spirit. God grieves in his spirit. It grieved God that he had made man because he saw the sorrow that man had brought himself into. And God was sorry for the sorrow that man had brought himself into through transgression. You say, well, why didn't God stop him? Well, if God stopped him, man wouldn't be a man anymore. He'd be a monkey then. And some people would rather be a monkey than a man. If God intervened in your affairs and made you and compelled you to obey what he wants you to do, then you would be an automatum. You'd be a robot. You'd be a mannequin. You'd no longer be a sophisticated human that he's placed upon the face of this earth with all the potential of making your own decisions and creating your own destiny. A place was made for you in heaven. It may be vacant. And the Bible says hell was made for the devil and his angels. It wasn't even made for you. But you may find your place there if you do not live the right kind of a life and you have to, you have to, you have to make that decision. But we wish to discuss with you this thing called grief. It most certainly is not good. It has nothing good related to it at all. There's so many manifestations of this grief that we have observed personally. Parents grieving over their children. And sometimes abnormally, not even leaving God a place to deal with the children, taking all the burden upon themselves. Jesus Christ is the great burden bearer. He came into this world to bear our burdens. Acquainted with grief. Acquainted with sorrows. The one that reaches and takes it away and heals it up. He has the right kind of medicine that can heal grief. Nobody else has it, but he does have it. And he can heal your grief. It just does not matter where you came from. <laughs> it does not matter what kind of grief you have. You're not particular nor peculiar. Jesus knows all about you. He's had a hundred million just like you before, and he can take care of it if you will permit him to. If you will say, now, Lord, I am not going to bear this sorrow in my heart. I'm not going to bear this sorrow in my mind. I'm going to be free from this thing. You will find that the Lord Jesus Christ loves you, cares for you, and has the anecdote for grief. He knows what to do. The druggist does not have it. Pep pills <laughs> might pep you up for a few moments. It'll never take grief away. Alcohol, you can't drown grief in alcohol. It'll, it'll upsurge. Every time, it'll come back to the surface. And you'll be in worse state than you were when you started. Because alcohol is a conceiver and a creator of grief. Maybe it creates more grief than any other commodity on the face of this earth. Alcohol does. And so when you drink it, you're drinking grief. It can kill you on the highway, cause you to destroy your home, your business, and your personal relationship with God. Now, there are many causes and reasons for grief. But whatever they are, we've brought the best news you ever heard. And that is, originally, God never intended for you to have grief. That God intended for you to be happy. And that the kingdom of God, when... Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And, and when you come unto God, the three components of his kingdom are righteousness, peace, and joy. There is no grief and no sadness and no fear and nothing negative in the kingdom. You know, the devil tells you, oh, when you become a Christian, you know, and become a Christian, you'll be sad. And all. You know, he is nothing but a liar. The only truly happy people in the whole world are the people that know God, and grief is gone. I have no grief. Now, I can have troubles and still not have grief. I can have problems and still not have grief. I can purchase a television station and be a couple of million dollars in the red and still not have grief. Because I have learned that I have a master, I have a friend, I have a Savior, I have a Lord, and I can bring my griefs to Him. And He makes it all different. He changes, He transforms, He blesses, He loves, and grief floats away. And I have His kingdom, His righteousness, which is the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all our sins, His peace that brings tranquility to the total being, quietness, 
composure, and I have joy. <laughs> well, what else? What else do you want on the face of this earth? It's the total quest of man to find joy and peace. You can't buy it. It's not for sale in the markets of the world today. But it's free. It's part of the kingdom, the golden kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ who came to save you from all of your sins and to change you by his mighty power. It's yours for the asking. He wants you to do it. You and I must both recognize until we get to this far, we are not going to flow together. Number one, that now human grief is a destroyer. It builds nothing. It blesses nothing. It helps nothing. It strengthens nothing. And it does no good. <laughs> All of your grief is not going to help you. It's not going to help your family. It's a destroyer. The people of our generation and our times must come to know that this deeply emotional problem and sorrow and disease and, and almost possession, and I believe it could become a possession, a demon possession situation, that, that, this, that this situation of grief can be alleviated, it can be destroyed, and you can have a, a happy life and a peaceful life. If I can share that with you, and if you can believe it, and if you can receive it, this will be the most important uh, program you've ever observed in your life. It bec can become the greatest. And I see you there with such great needs. And I believe God at this moment to set you free by His mighty power. I see grief like a great gigantic net. I, I used to go fishing when I lived in Florida as a boy. And we went what we call mullet fishing. Mullet is a very fine food uh, there on the, on the coast of Florida, especially in the uh, Gulf Coast area where we used to fish around Panama City. And we, we'd throw the net, sometimes get 15, 20, 25 mullet, beautiful fine fish, you know, this long. And, and, and they were so delicious, fresh from the waters onto the table within two hours' time, and they were so delicious. We caught them with a net, and grief is like that net. Uh, grief is a net that's gets cast over people, and, and, and they find themselves caught in it, and they say, I can't get out. Now, th that may be your problem, but I want to tell you something. There's a person that'll cut that net. His name is Jesus. He'll break that net. His name is Jesus. And you don't have to be caught in a net of grief and say, there's no human way out of this, because there is a way out. And I'm bringing you the way out and showing you the way out encouraging you to take the way out, that you might come to know the peace that Jesus Christ purchased for you. He is our peace. The joy He purchased for you, that's been paid for. You cannot purchase it again. It's already been paid for. All you can do is receive it and accept it and enjoy it because it's yours. I want you to receive it. I want you to receive it in His name. As I've gone throughout the planet Earth, and where we've lived. I've sat down in the Eskimo homes of Alaska, and I've listened to the mothers, to the fathers, to the young people spell out their grief. Of mothers with their head down saying, my daughter just had her first illegitimate child. We weren't expecting that to happen in our family. And the father would bow his head and said, my son, he ran off. I don't know where he is. And I've listened to the young people saying, I don't want this village of 200 people. Where can I go? How can I get away from here? And so in the far reaches of civilization, I, 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 I've witnessed grief. I was in on a very funny piece one night. I was in Wiseman, which is 80 miles north of the Arctic Circle. I was staying in the home of the postmaster. He had about the nicest home there in the little village, Eskimo village. And uh, he had a little store besides being the postmaster and had a little room where, where I slept. And after I went to bed, they had a quarrel, a loud quarrel. And finally, uh, he made fun of her. She wanted to order something out of the scissor book catalog. We were all looking at the catalog. When you get up there, the catalog gets real pretty. And there are no stores, and so the catalog gets mighty pretty. And you do all your buying by ordering. And we'd, we'd all looked at the catalog, and she had settled on something she wanted. And evidently, after I went to bed, he had said no. And that's a, that's a bad thing to go to bed on. You might say no at 7 in the morning, but don't do it at 10 o'clock at night unless you want to have trouble. And I heard her. 
she screamed out at him and she said, American woman, good enough for you. Eskimo woman, too good. And I couldn't hardly go to sleep laughing. I thought it was about the funniest thing. She went around with, with a deer skin uh, all over her. She was, she was dressed in skin. Her boots were made of skin. Uh, her, her clothes, her coat was made of, of skin off those reindeer up there. Everything she had was made of skin. She looked pretty raw. And he didn't look any better. Uh, but <laughs> there they were living 70 miles north of the, of, of the Arctic Circle and quarreling. And she was grief stricken. And she said, an Eskimo woman is just too good for you, oh, white eyes, oh, blue eyes and white, fi white face. And I just laughed and laughed. I said, no doubt she's right. But I knew grief in those remote places. On the antipodes of this in the heart of the jungles of Brazil, I've lived with those Indians for as long as five months without a bed. I had no bed for five months. I, I slept in hammocks, hanged them in trees between two poles or anywhere that we could put them. And I'd sit around the campfires at night with my interpreter right close to my ear and listen to the Indians talk and, and, and have them to laugh and, and to say, you know, you don't ask us to be Christian. And my interpreter would tell me, and, I, and I'd say, why? And they said, the soldiers, they're Christian, and they kill us. I said, we don't want to be Christian. And I said, would you like to be a follower of Jesus? Oh, Jesus, sounds good. Tell us about Jesus. I tell them about Jesus. Oh, yes, we be Jesus person, no Christian person. Christians, killers. And then down inside, you see, in that great, in that great, uh, they, all white people to them were Christians. But when you told them about Jesus, they said, oh, yes, we want it. But their sorrows are just as real or more real than yours. Their privation is, is so great, living in those green hell jungles of the middle of South America. But they grieve. But on the other hand, one of the greatest griefs I ever met was living in a castle in Switzerland. Sorrow is I had to help a person that owned the castle. I've eaten lunch in Hamden Court Palace in London, and there was a sorrow there that they'd invited me to heal. The eating was almost incidental to the sorrow that I'd gone to heal. And so we have met this thing called grief in the highest and the lowest of places. Uh, we have met it in the banker's office. Uh, we have met it in the saddest of situations, in the lowest of situations. Uh, grief has no friends. It will destroy any human being on the face of this planet Earth. And you've got to know this, and then you will know how to, to fight it, to resist it, to plan against it. It makes no friends. When you have grief, you have no friends. Grief is not a friend, it's an enemy. It is a destroyer. It can take away your health. It can give you real diseases, real diseases that kill. Neighbors, we want you to know freedom from it. Now, if the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth for the predominant reason of setting you free from grief, because grief comes from sin, then you should accept it. If he's willing to do it without money and without price, you should be humble enough to accept it. There's certain things you can buy. You can buy a garment. You can buy food. You can buy a house. But you can't buy joy. And you can't buy happiness. And you can't buy relief from grief. Your doctor can suck you full of drugs. That won't ever leave you. The store can sell you a, a quart of liquor. That won't relieve you. Down the alley, you can, you can sniff heron. That's not going to relieve you. I want to tell you something. There's only one thing that can take away grief. That's the beautiful one called Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of the Most High God, the Savior of all mankind, the one who said, I am the shepherd. Won't you receive him right now? Bless them, Lord. Please do. I command grief to go. It's an ugly monster. I destroy it by faith and command it to go. May you forever be free from grief. Many of you will say, Brother Sumrall, I want to hear it again. Sometimes it's only in hearing it two or three times that you really get it. We want you to hear it again. For a donation of only $5, you'll get everything you've heard upon a 
an audio tape, this one right here, and we can send it to you. We pay the postage for it, only $5. You may order it today, and we'd be glad for you to have it. And if you're in the video world, this is the Betamax. You may get this from us also. We, we have these in stock. You can get this lesson on Betamax if you like. If you want it in the other system, there are two of them. This is the VHS. And you may get what you've heard today on this VHS in order to have it in your own home. There are others that deal in the three-quarter inch that we send out all over the world. And these will go all over the world. And you can have them in the three-quarter inch. And uh, we'd like for you to have these. You may order them and make your inquiries to Lester Sumrall, Box 12, South Bend, Indiana, zip code 46624. Let us hear from you. And you that have been set free from grief, we want especially to hear from you. We'd just be so glad if you'd sit down and write us and say, grief is gone because of what you said. I'm glad to be free from it. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Part three is coming up on grief. Don't miss it. Tell your neighbors and friends about it. This is the message that America needs today, and we're glad to be giving it to you. Thank you.